Uh, first of all, it's good to be here. And it's good to be able to hear, particularly to speak about um, this issue of Alzheimer's and dementia because, well, first of all, it's topical and it's one of these uh, issues that's never going to go away. But also, I think it's profoundly misunderstood. When you look at the way in which uh, dementia is framed, uh, particularly in, in the media, but also in this public opinion, people seem to be more afraid of developing dementia or Alzheimer's than having cancer. Cancer, once upon a time, was a big thing that everybody was afraid of, but now it seems to be dementia. And we need to think through what that is, because the way in which we frame our understandings of a particular illness will determine the way that we respond to people. So the things that you name, or the way that you name things, determines our response. If you're terrified of something, you'll respond with terror. If you're fearful, you'll respond with, with fear. And fear and violence are very closely connected. So it's important that we think through why it is that people seem to be so afraid of this particular human experience. Uh, when you look at the, the kind of public persona of dementia, it's profoundly negative. It's a highly stigmatized illness. But think about what stigma is. When you stigmatize something, stigma comes from the, the, the slave trade, wherein you would uh, buy a human being, and then the slave master would put a mark onto that human being. And then that human being would be reduced to the size of that mark. You would no longer be a person. Now you are simply that mark. And that's precisely what stigma does. It reduces the whole of your universe to the size of your diagnosis. So if you have schizophrenia, another heavily uh, stigmatized label, you become a schizophrenic. You know, if you have the flu, you don't become the flu. If you have schizophrenia, you become the flu, that, that, that condition. Likewise, if you have dementia, you become a dementia sufferer with all the implications that that has. So stigma it takes away personhood. Stigma reduces us to, to uh, labels, to ideas, to bodies, and forgets that we are people with hearts. And so I want to, in the short time that I've got, I want to open up a different understanding of dementia. Not disconnected, but different. Because I think there's much more to dementia than we oftentimes assume there to be. And more importantly, there's much more to the experience of people with dementia than we oftentimes assume there to be. One of the things that we need to notice is that any condition is experienced in a particular context. And that context is profoundly important for our understanding of, uh, the, uh, or rather, our responses to that particular uh, experience. It's pretty clear that Western society um, is hypercognitive. Stephen Post, uh, a wonderful ethicist who's written extensively on, uh, on Alzheimer's, uses that term, hypercognitive. A hypercognitive society is a society that prizes intellect and reason above love, relationships, community, and being together in that sense. So that's something that we assume to be particularly important about intellect and reason that other cultures perhaps don't, and certainly don't, in fact. So within our culture, we tend to think that the essence of who you are as a human being is who you think you are as a human being. The essence of humanness is thinking. So I think, therefore I am. And that's the way that we uh, have inherited a worldview from Descartes, but it is the way we think. You know, as soon as you meet somebody, you'll, you'll ask them, well, what do you do? And then you'll place them on a hierarchy, depending on whether or not you think that they're important in that sense. So we're constantly judging and engaging people by what they can do and what they can think and how they use their intellect. So if you uh, encounter a mental health problem, or if you encounter something like dementia, then your social context gives it a very particular meaning. If you're losing your memory, if your cognition is damaged, if your intellect is beginning to shift away in different ways, that is per particularly profound within a culture like our own. <clears throat> so if you have cancer, people will sympathize. If you begin to lose your mind, then people have a completely different response. So we need to think carefully about why it is that Western cultures have that stigmatic perspective on dementia. And that's what I want us to kind of tease out a little bit. And sitting at the heart, I think, of some of the ways in which we uh, fear dementia is that sense that we're going to lose ourselves. We have this idea that 
ourselves who we are as an autobiographical self. As long as we can tell our story, then we are who we are. If we cease to tell a story, then we cannot possibly be who we are. And of course, if you lose your memory, it appears that you can no longer tell your story. So therefore, you lose your personhood, because your personhood is your story. And this is a, an extract from a, a poem by um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a very famous German theologian. And he wrote it from his time in prison. He was in prison because he was involved with uh, a plot to kill Hitler. And he eventually was executed in prison. But he was trying to work out who he was in a, condition, a situation where he was isolated. With all of the kind of social structures and social markers that gave him the sense of who he was began to have been taken away from him. So he says, who am I, this or the other? Am I one person today and tomorrow another? Am I both at once a hypocrite before others and before myself a contemptibly woebegone weakling? Or is something within me still like a beaten army, fleeing in disorder from victory already achieved? Who am I? They mock me, these lonely questions of mine. Whoever I am, thou knowest, God, I am thine. But Bonhoeffer is wrestling with that whole big existential of who am I? He comes to the conclusion that I am who God says I am. But in the midst of that, his confusion, that really he does empathize in some senses with the experience of dementia. You know, because when you face the, the experience of dementia, all the big existential questions come up. Who am I? Where do I come from? Where am I going to? And why? These big spiritual questions that all of the world's religions at some point or other have tried to, in different ways to answer, immediately become part of your experience. And the great terror that people experience in relation to dementia is that sense that you're losing who you are. So who am I is the question. And you can see that in the way that people use language. You no, know, she's not the person she used to be. Well, if she's not the person she used to be, then who on earth is she? I'd kill myself if I ended up like that. Well, why would dementia be a matter of life and death in that sense? I'd rather remember him the way that he was. I have a good friend that uh, died sadly last year who had Alzheimer's and I spoke to one of his friends and I said, do you ever go to visit uh, Peter? And he said, no, I prefer to remember them the way he was. So it's like he's disappeared from the social horizon. All he is is a memory. So Peter loses his memory and he loses himself. He becomes a memory. What he is in the present disappears. And Bob DeMarco puts it like this. I'm saddened when I hear these words. This is not the person I knew. These words objectify the person living with Alzheimer's. When you objectify a person, you dehumanize them. Once dehumanized, the person becomes a villain. And you can see how that runs in the way that we use a language. You can see how that runs in the European conversations around euthanasia, where the, the, the diagnosis of dementia is enough for you to be able to uh, go forward for euthanasia. And you can see by the, the, how that works and the, the fear that we have in relation to uh, experiencing dementia. But let's think about it slightly differently. These guys, that kind of language says, you've lost yourself, you've lost your personhood. But what does it mean to be who you are? What makes you who you are? What makes you a self in that sense? Well, Stephen Sabat, who, who's a, a psychologist who specializes in uh, rethinking dementia, talks about the idea of personhood and selfhood in a quite different way. He says, the kind of stigmatized uh, idea that you lose your personhood is just not sustainable. And so he develops a really interesting model of the self. It's a threefold self. And he points to the fact that the, all, all our understandings of selfhood are, are constructed by our, our society and by, constructed by our, our understandings. So threefold selfhood. Self one is the experiencing self. So as long as you are conscious and aware, then uh, you, you, you remain absolutely a self. And so he says that you know, as long as you have some way of uh, recognizing that you're in the world, so if you respond to stimuli, if you're able to use I language, self language, if you're able to respond in these kinds of different ways to a multitude of, a multitude of different types of communication, then you yourself. 
You're a sentient being who exists in the world and is, who deserves to be recognized as fully human and fully a person. Self, too, has to do with your social context. And it has to do with things like your biology. So self, too, is the, the color of your uh, eyes, your height, these kind of, these kind of um, standard biological things that make you who you are and show you and reveal yourself to, to other people in the world. And within self, too, you can have, uh, you, you can uh, kind of accrue different modes of diff uh, different roles and different definitions. So you could become a university lecturer, you could become uh, a religious person, or you can become somebody who, uh, be, uh, who begins to be named as a dementia sufferer or an Alzheimer's sufferer. In stage two, as Stephen Sabat says, you're able to tell your own story. So you have control over the situation. You don't have control over your biology, but your biology is not going to do much, much changing. But in terms of the social roles that you have and the social roles that you are given, you're able to tell, to tell different stories if people tell your story wrong. So if somebody says to you, um, you're a waste of time because you've got dementia, you can say, no, I'm not. And you have a counter story. You're able to counter particular negative things that are said about yourself. Self two. Self three, Sabat says, is quite, quite different. Self three is the identity that's given to you by your community. So for example, it's impossible to have a friend on your own. Friendship has to be given to you. It's something that's given to you by your community. And you're shaped and formed by your community in quite particular ways. And you need your community in order to uh, be who you are. So for example, I couldn't be a husband without a wife. I couldn't be a father without children. I couldn't be a, a lecturer to you if you all left. I would cease to be that. So self three is the most fragment, uh, fragile dimension of who you are. Because self three is out with your control. So self one, you exist. Self two, you have c control and, and the ability to tell counter narratives. Self three is where you're vulnerable. And what Stephen Sabat says is it's self three uh, where people with dementia are particularly vulnerable. And particularly with advanced dementia because you cannot tell uh, your story well. And even if you do, the power of stigma means that people won't take you seriously. So if you have a, a diagnosis of dementia, you can never just lose your keys. It's always sucked into your diagnosis. And so therefore that becomes the lens through which everything that you do is looked at. And your worldview your, uh, begins to get shrink and get much, much smaller. And your possibilities for relationality and for friendship begin to disappear. Because it's very clear when you look at the literature, the one thing that uh, uh, is a common experience for all people with dementia is that their friends begin to disappear as soon as they have a diagnosis. They just, people just fall away. And, and like the, the example I gave to you is very typical of the way that people are. It's like certain forms of Western friendship are just not strong enough to cope with the, the possibility that you can't get what you want back from an individual. And so what Sabat says is that Dementia doesn't take away your personhood. However, it can take away your self free. In other words, you can lose yourself because your community loses you. So it's not a biological loss of personhood, it's a communal loss of personhood. Because much of who we are is given to us. And a good way to, to kind of tie that together is you know, if Western culture says, I think theref therefore I am, is, is its essence of what a person is. If you move into African Ubuntu theology and African Ubuntu philosophy, you see something different. I am because we are. When we are together, I can be. In other words, we all need our community in order to be who we are. The problem for people with dementia is that the community begins to disappear. And that disappears because it misunderstands, not necessarily simply because it's malicious. And it's not malicious, it just misunderstands. So the problem for many people with dementia is not so much that they uh, uh, forget, but that they are forgotten. And that's very, very important. Right? The, the memory problem for many people with dementia lies in the community, not within the individual. Um, and that brings us to the, the issue of memory. Memory. 
Now, one of the uh, most devastating things about dementia is that you, you lose your memory and you begin to forget about those whom you love and forget the things that you used to think, find so wonderful in life. And it looks as if people are losing their memory. And at one level, they are. But at a number of other levels, they're not. Think about it in this way. Um, if I uh, want to remember anything about my childhood, which wasn't very long ago, I hasten to add, <laughs> I have to ask my mother, because I can't remember. You know? And she tells me this story, and she tells me that story, and she couldn't tell me any story, of course. Like, um, but she's very good. Uh, in other words, I can't remember aspects of who I am. I'm, I'm dependent on other people uh, to remember for me, even though I don't have dementia. You know, if, and if you guys, some of you are writing things down. Some people use computers to remember things. Our memory is all over the place. It lives within our community. Some of it lives biologically within ourselves, but a good deal of our memory lives in all sorts of different places. So the idea that we are, uh, people with dementia simply lose their memory isn't 100% case because your memory is there. The question is who's going to remember your story well? And that's, what, that's when it gets difficult when people begin to reject you. But also there's a, that fascinating phenomenon of body memory. The idea that your, your body remembers things. And <clears throat> you know, I, I, certainly when I was a chaplain one of the things that always I always found stunning was the way you used to go into and when I, in these days we used to have these big uh, dementia wars, and that was what they were called, they were awful. And 40 or 50 people would be sitting there and they'd all be watching uh, children's program, programs and then we'd kind of wonder why they were so withdrawn. That's your day, that's your life, that's your horizon. But then you would go in there as a chaplain and you'd take the sacraments and suddenly something would change. People who seemed to be somewhere else for most of the week would suddenly engage in the sacrament would suddenly sing a song, would suddenly take on the, the gestures and the postures of worship. Now, I remember you used to have these strange conversations with psychologists or psychiatrists who would just say, well, it's well-ingrained memory. That doesn't really mean anything. Um, but I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not convinced that that was, was, was the case. Like. Because one of the ways that we, uh, one of the things we assume about memory is that it has to do with recall. Right, so when we think about memory, we think we, you know, human beings are time travelers. We're always moving backwards and forwards in time. So we think that we recall something from the past, bring it into the present, and then that enables us to understand the future a little bit more clearly. And that's the way, that's, that's the way we think about memory. And that's certainly uh, the way that some people with dementia begin to lose that ability to time travel, to move in that way, to recall things and bring them into the, the present. But recall memory is only one dimension of web memory because body memory is something that's quite different. Body memory emerges when over time you've practiced particular things and your body has taken on the shape and the form of these practices. So in, ter as a, in terms of being a chaplain, people over time have, have practiced the Eucharist, have practiced prayer, have practiced the, the, the postures of worship. And now when they can no longer cognate them, then something different happens. It's not that uh, the, the, these, these actions uh, and bodily movements are meaningless. It's quite the opposite. What body language does is it brings memory into the present and acts it out, works it out. In other words, when you see these men and women engaging in these practices, you're actually watching memory. You're seeing something. And, <coughs> and it's meaningful because it's done by someone. It's intentional. Body language doesn't just, doesn't just happen, it's intentional. If Mary or Jeff or John do these things, it's Mary and Jeff and John that are doing these things. It's not their body that suddenly disappeared. They may not be able to cognate in the same way as they always did, but it's meaningful, it's intentional, it's quite beautiful in many, many respects. And likewise, when somebody starts to sing, you know, it was always fantastic to hear people engaging in, in, in songs of worship or songs even pop songs, whatever kind of it is, people begin to sing. And people go, oh, isn't that quaint? And at one level it is quaint, because it's, it's kind of quite sweet. Um, but when you think about it, you know, memory is processed all over the brain, so the brain doesn't have uh, uh, specific places for, uh, for memory. So the, there's parts of your brain that process it more than others. 
um, but it happens all over the place. But the part of your brain that, that processes memory, or um, a major memory processor, is quite close to the part of your brain that processes music. Right? So that there's a kind of resonance there. Now, one of the things that we maybe don't think about is that sometimes uh, when uh, a memory is lost, it's not actually lost at all. What happens is you, the neurons and the synaptic connections are broken, and so you can no longer access the memory, so you can no longer get to that memory. Music can be a bridge that enables you to access memories that cannot be accessed in any other way. You know, and that, you know, that's why you, sometimes you get, it's fascinating, because you get residual, you know, some people will be singing, and then you'll get residual memory, and people will be happier and, and, and more uh, engaged for some time after singing. Right? So it's like these connections come together, and then they fade again. Um, but of course, the thing about music is that you uh, don't just listen to music, it takes you somewhere. It's full of emotions, it's full of feelings, it takes you to a place, it takes you to a time, it takes you to people. And so when these guys are singing and doing the thing, it's not like it's, it's just blind, they're actually going somewhere. If you give them the benefit of the doubt, they're going somewhere experiencing things that they haven't been able to experience at other times. So whilst it's certainly the case that people lose their memory in relation to dementia, but when you expand your understanding of, dementia, of memory, then you can see that that's not quite as straightforward as it may seem. So with my main point would be this. We need to change the way that we think and see people with dementia. We, we don't only have to change our attitudes, we have to change our culture. We have to change the way that we think, the way that we see the world, and the images and possibilities that enable us to see the world in particular ways. Now, as a theologian, um, uh, that takes me into that final dimension there. Because it seems to me that the key thing for people with dementia is that they're remembered well. Your task, my task, is to hold me people's memories and to enable them to be remembered well, even though they can't tell their counter stories and can't uh, defend themselves in that sense. So theologically, there's something interesting in there. And the best way for me to illustrate that is just simply with a, a story. The, uh, uh, a friend of mine from Adelaide in Australia, a nurse called Margaret Hutchison, gave me this, this story, which I think illustrates, or at least takes us into some interesting areas if you're interested in theology. And she tells a story of um, uh, an elderly woman who was in, with her words, in mid-stage dementia. Now, I'm not convinced about stages, but she was mid-stage. In other words, she was, she was normally quite passive. She was losing certain things, but she was doing quite well in, in many other areas of her life. And for no particular reason or no obvious reason, she suddenly became really distressed. She became really anxious and really troubled. And she began to walk up and down the ward, repeating a single word over and over and over again. Now, the ward team got together and they uh, tried to decide what it is that they should do. Should they medicate her? Should they uh, restrain her? Should they do whatever they should do? But eventually, one nurse got alongside of her and began to kind of try to tune in to what was happening in the midst of that. Uh, and she eventually picked up that the word that the woman was saying over and over and over again was God. So, so she was repeating God, 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 God. And the nurse kind of worked out what it was that was going on. And she said to her, are you afraid that you're going to uh, forget God? Because this woman had been a religious person all of her life. And for her, this was terrifying. And she said, yes, I'm afraid that I'm going to forget God. And the, the nurse said to her, well, you might forget God, but God will never forget you. Uh, and at that moment, her anxiety was dissipated. And she may well have gone on to, to uh, forget God, but she found peacefulness in that simple reframe of her situation and that simple reminder that it wasn't her memory that was significant, it was the memory of God that was significant. Now, there's a whole lot of things that we can do and think around that. But think about it, those of you who are religious in any sense, like, the implication there is that your task, my task, is to hold the memory. It's to enable people to be sure and comfortable that if they were, are to lose their memory, then there are people there who can hold it, who can hold it in ways that help them to retain who they are 
even though they may not know who they are. And for this woman, it wasn't so much remembering who she was that was the healing turning point, it was remembering who she was, who she belonged to, and what that meant for her. So what I want to suggest, is, as, as I come to the end of what I'm going to say, is that we need to shift our cultural thinking. We need to change the way in which we do community and the way in which we understand people with dementia as belonging to our communities. The temptation is always to push people out into facilities and think that they're over here so we may go and visit them, but we're, our real community is here. I think we need to uh, create a sense of community within which each person, irrespective of the circumstances, really does belong. Now, in order to belong, you need to be missed. So you need to be in a place where if, if you're not there, people are looking for you. If you're not there, people miss you and people long for you to be there. Now, it seems to me that people with dementia are very rarely missed. Or if they are, what is missed is what used to be. Now, I think we need to think about what it looks like to create communities of belonging where we respect the past and what was, but we recognize now there's something new. And we begin to look carefully and, uh, and compassionately at how we can develop that which is before us, that person who's before us, in new ways, in fresh ways, in ways which give them a sense that they belong to the communities that we claim to represent. So creating places of belonging requires a different way of looking. Um, so it's understandable that we should fear dementia. It's understandable that there should be grief and lament and a deep sense of loss. But it's not understandable that we should reject people and assume that they have somehow become something that they never have been before. These people are people. And if we get the right angle, if we begin to look at people properly, then dementia will still be frightening, but it will be hopeful. And there will be new possibilities that will open up the space for us to create communities of belonging where each one of us is missed. Thank you.